I always prefer to go where we are most strong sure. in terms of our evidence. So he was definitely viewed as a Thracian bard, that is a singer and a poet. He lived in a historical place at a historical time and he was a real dude and he wrote real poems. It's really climate of Alexandria that, that makes the strongest connection between Orpheus and Jesus in the Protrepticus. And in the Protrepticus, Clement portrays Jesus as the true Orpheus. There's a hymn that Jesus sings as Orpheus, but it's because Jesus is the true Orpheus when the logo said Orpheus Dei, the Orpheus of God, who was Jesus. So this, this is a fairly common idea. The Homeric or, or Greek Hermes was the logo since so far as he transferred logi, that is messages. But when he becomes Hermes thrice great, that logos aspect is enriched. So he becomes very much the creator of the world, much more like the logos in John 1. She received huge attention from Vespasian, later became a huge donor the Emperor Vespasian for both Isis and Osiris. It's received huge funding, an amazing temple. This is the reason why Roman Catholics today don't give communion to people who aren't Roman Catholic. The um, well, same thing with the Greek Orthodox, because those are mysteries. And if you're not really this part of that religious identity, get out. And welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with, once again, the great sage, M. David Litwa. And uh, we have a course coming up. A lot of you guys know about this course coming up. It is amazing. I was helping editing it, and there is so much information in these courses that you cannot get on Wikipedia. This is real deep scholarship, and it's straight to the sources straight to what the ancient texts say, straight to what the archaeologist archaeology says. This is all really amazing stuff. And so just just stay um, a little bit patient. It's on its way. We have the final touches being put onto the course, and um, it's coming. And also, real quick, Dr. M. David Litwa has his Patreon, is one of my, my go-to resources for learning about early Christianity, Gnosticism, ancient mystery religions, and, you know, things related to those things. And there's exclusive content on there that you won't, you can't get on his public YouTube channel that he's actually starting to launch now. So you can go to his YouTube channel, which I linked in the description, and there's videos on it that are public. But if you want to go deeper than that, there's the Patreon. So just want to throw that out there before we begin. How are you doing today? Exactly. Thanks, Neil. And I should say, I mean, a lot of thanks goes to Neil because Neil has really done a lot of the patient editing for the course. And um, so all of you should give him a thank you for that. And uh, and yeah, hopefully this will be first of many courses that uh, are given. And what I always tell people is I'm not dumbing it down here. I give you the material I would give to any undergraduate classroom or a preliminary graduate student um, and I give further reading and I let you take it from there and make your own decisions. There is a lot out there and what I'm trying to do is get that scholarly uh, evidence-based information out there. Absolutely and that's exactly what you've been doing. So what I want to do today is give a little bit of a teaser on what these courses are about. We have seven main areas of what we're looking at and it's the seven different locations that practice the mysteries and their respective rites their their theologies and they relate to each other and they're also very different and so i figured we'll start with the samothracian mysteries and uh, what what can you tell us without giving away too much because we got the course but just to just to give people an appetite of what is out there and what they might be interested to go further on well, 
I love the Samothracian mysteries because one of our main literary sources for them is one of my very favorite of all uh, basically Christian or sometimes Gnostic Christian groups, and that is the Nascenes. Mm -hmm. And the Nascene writer says that there was a mystery cult in Samothrace, and that as you entered the sacred chamber, there were two men called Adamas, and in the plural Adamese, and they were completely naked, and that they had their penises erect like hardened stone. And as you went through this sacred chamber, you were reminded of the secret mysteries of what he thought were, was, you know, male energy, but allegorized as the pure, rational, life-creating force of the universe. Wow. But there's so much more. Um, and obviously, the Nassim writer is talking, you know, in, in very late second century. And these mysteries were running for, they're as old as the Eleusinian mysteries. And so they're, they're half a millennium or more prior to Jesus. Wow. Now that is amazing. And, and I've, I've edited the course, obviously. And I'm just going to say real quick, that's just 1% of the iceberg right there. The, right off the bat, and course number one, you really just just hit a home run with this one, with the Samo, Samothracian Mysteries, this island in the middle of the, is it the Aegean Sea? Is that what they call it? Yep. Yeah, right in the middle of the Aegean. Well, kind of not in the middle, but like you're off the coast of like where uh, Thrace is, I guess, right? Thrace and Macedonia. Yeah, northern, northern Aegean. You can still go there today and, and see the archaeological ruins. They're, the archaeological ruins of this cult site are extremely well preserved and really worth visiting. Wow. And the last thing I want to, before we go to the next one, it, this Adam, Adamas, is there a connection to Adam at all? Or is this just a coincidence? Well, the Nassim writer thinks so. Uh, we have an inscription uh, addressing the Samothracian gods as Adamese. And in Greek, that means unconquered ones or men of steel. And um, the Nassim preacher uh, connected that to the primal human deity who was Adamas and who was the model for the first earthly human being called Adam. Wow. So you could just, this Nassim preacher, whoever he was, was clearly some sort of religious genius. Just like putting things in places and connecting dots that no one else was thinking about way ahead of his time. Very much of a syncretist, would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, syncretism has a little bit of a bad connotation. I would probably just call him um, cosmopolitan. He's a polymath. He's, uh, he's, he's very, very bright, but he's doing a lot of things that are, that people of his time were doing, that is allegorizing the mysteries. And so in that sense, he's not entirely unique, but he's, he's certainly fun to read and distinctive among Christian authors. And so he has this Nassim preacher hymn that's given down to us by Hippolytus. And according to Hippolytus, he applies it to Jesus. Now, do you think this was do you think this actually got outside of his group or his cult or do you think this was do you think this was used by other Christians as well because I don't I'm not sure if it was but what do you think Well you're opening a huge can of worms uh, so <laughs> the the first thing I should say is that I yes all this material it is transmitted by a heresiologist I don't think it's Hippolytus. He used to be called Hippolytus, but this heresiologist, we don't actually know his, his name. So I just call him the refutator because he writes the refutation of all heresies. But the basically the preacher, the Nassim preacher, quotes a hymn, actually several hymns, but two of the hymns to Addis, and we'll get to Addis in a moment, uh, yeah. we believe... Um, 
are Hadrianic, that is written in the early second century in the reign of Hadrian, and would have been sung in Alexandria in the, you know, throughout the Mediterranean world. We don't know how well known they were, but they're not written by the Nicene preacher. They are, they are actually cult hymns sure. in honor of Attis. Yeah. Interesting. Wow, that's really fascinating. And do you think, well, you know what? I'm just going to go on to that. I was going to ask you about the Antonius Hadrian sort of, what is, would you call that a cult or like a little, a little bit of a, what do you, what would you even call that? His, his little, his dedication to his boyfriend who passed away. Is that, a, is, was that, was there a religion based off that? Or is that just like a one-off thing? Oh, absolutely. Antonus was a full-blown Greco-Roman god. And wow. um, we have more sculpture of Antonus than we do of many other traditional Greco-Roman gods. He was extremely popular, worshipped throughout the Mediterranean, and therefore really bugged and bothered the Christians. Um, and yeah, that, now that's a separate that's a separate yeah. session in itself, but absolutely. And there were also mysteries of Antinous that were generated um, in the, the 140s uh, and celebrated where he was worshipped. I think at, at the very least, it shows us that the mentality of the times was there. you can have a new god or a new apotheosis or a new religion just sprout up out of nowhere. Like, not out of nowhere, but, like, people were being more creative with their spirituality in this time period. Whereas now it's kind of like, oh, you're either a Muslim or you're Christian or you're a... And, like, then you had the, the New Age people. But, like, this in this p time period, it seems like there was a lot more openness to spirituality. Or what would you, what would you say? Well, I would say that, yeah, ancient Greco-Roman Hellenic style religion is much more like modern Hindu styles of religion where you do have deified ancestors and people becoming gods all the time and the pantheon can expand um, and I mean I guess it could retract but usually it expands and you see divinity in everything and everyone and you're open to new gods and new gods you know, don't threaten the old gods because divinity isn't a zero-sum game. Like, if I get divinity, you don't lose it. Um, whereas in modern monotheistic religions, uh, the patriarchal god gets really angry if he has a competitor <laughs> because that takes away from his worship. So he will blast and attack you. Interesting. I want to move over now to the great mysteries of Eleusinian. Eleusinian mysteries. I was Eleusinian. Yep. Yeah. Eleusinian. Um, this is right near Athens, pretty much. And this was a very famous ancient mystery uh, site. And um, yeah, these secret mysteries that apparently Aeschylus, the poet, got in trouble for releasing too much knowledge of this place. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. This is also in the courses, but we're not going to, we're going to give you a little taste of what's going to be in the course. Yeah. So Eleusinian mysteries are sort of like the basic prototypical mysteries. They are the prototypical celebration of the invention of agriculture. Um, and they tell the story of how uh, basically the people were were dying um, and how the divine mother lost her daughter and uh, the so-called rape of Persephone and her redemption out of the earth and how that is involved with the grain and the gift of the produce by the the mother deity in this case Demeter and there were mysteries. And uh, again, the, we have the foundations of the mystery hall still preserved today that you can go see. And it was, uh, again, the prototypical mystery. If you were starting a mystery cult, you would often use Eleusis as a model. 
uh, for how you were going to run the cult. And the most famous attack on Eleusis was by Clement of Alexandria in his book, The Protrepticus. Um, and so, yes, Christians eventually, eventually uh, fought hard. And when they gained control, they finally closed down the Eleusinian sanctuary, which was running very strong up until the fifth century. Wow. So that's, again, 500 years of rough, roughly after Jesus. Would you, would you consider this to be a, 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 a mysteries that are somewhat influenced by the Sumerian Ishtar Tammuz um, mythology? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, we're dealing with um, part of Part of what everyone should know is that the mysteries were, in fact, never revealed. Um, right. And so they have to be reconstructed. But there's lots of myths and stories that have to do with agricultural production, um, the, the, the loss of grain and then the finding of grain, uh, the, the dry season and the wet season. And in some respects, we we do think that, yeah, a lot of these stories are entangled, but they were definitely local color, local variants. We do know that, that at Athens, they celebrated the Adonis cult, uh, which Adonis is Tammuz, and they made gardens for Adonis, which means that they made little pots with which you grow grass in and, and then the grass quickly withers and dies. And then you you throw that away in a celebration. And this, this ritual is still uh, preserved today in modern Persia and Iran. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, yes, it's part of the Hafsin uh, ceremony or, or ritual. So uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's extremely um, widespread ritual activity. Yeah, I was talking to Kyle Ruck about this, and it seems to be a seems to be a allegory for the seasons, um, dying and, and death and re rebirth in the sense of, you know, the plants die and wither, but they give us the seeds. The seeds can plant new seeds, and so it's a resurrection. It's coming from that. It's like uh, it's 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 a cycle, but it's all it's. But when you reflect that to the human condition, it's very interesting to see. Because in our sometimes in our lives we have to go through um, passions and downturns, but we get we rise up through them. So yeah, it doesn't, it, it's it's not surprising that people in the ancient world would be really attracted to this. You know, yeah, the mysteries, to put it another way, are were a way for ancient people to live their myths, whereas we are divorced from the truth of the myths. They lived their myths. That is, they saw them reenacted and they participated in them. They became the characters in the myth. And so that experience was revolutionary and life-changing. The closest thing that we have would be, I guess, these, these passion plays that sometimes Christians put on, where they literally, you know, reenact um, the crucifixion of Jesus and even put put a guy, you know, with fake blood on a cross and have him scream. And that is sort of these mystery plays, these passion plays is about, is the closest that Christians come to this reenactment of the mysteries. But it, and in the end, it's fundamentally different because it was much more involved um, and widespread in the ancient world. Yeah, I agree with that. It's a lot more different. And plus it's based on a historical person and historical time period. A, a real grassroots movement happening in the Galilee. Um, so it has that personal aspect when it comes to Christianity. But I do think it's history, interesting that they, they a lot of these parables are agricultural, you know, the vine, I am the vine, my father is the husbandman, or, you know, you're, you know, the, planting the seeds, some of them will grow up and get choked by a vine. It's like a lot of the imagery seems to be using um, agricultural. I don't know if that's on purpose or if it's just, that's an easy way to tell an allegory. Uh, you know what I mean? Yes, but I would, I would caution against what I consider the apologetic argument that apologists 
Christian apologists like to say that their religion is historical and other religions are more um, mythical and allegories of nature. And that's not really the case. Be it's, a, it's more like both and, in my understanding. They actually did believe that Demeter visited Athens. Right. And they did believe that she lost her daughter. And they did believe that those events happened historically because Demeter interacted with other historical characters in Athenian history, namely Tritolemus, who, be, who was the Athenian Johnny Appleseed, who spread the knowledge of agricultural production. So it's not just a matter of, oh, this is just an allegory of how nature works. These are repetitions of historical events as they were understood by the ancients. Now, again, I say that we are alienated from the truth of the myth because we no longer attribute any historical value to it, but they did. And that's really important to remember. Yeah, and even, even someone like Dionysus, who's also linked with Demeter, in many ways, they're they're telling the story of Alexander the Great going all the way to India, and he's looking for the places where Dionysus was. Like exactly. you wouldn't you wouldn't waste your resources finding a myth, some mythical character's location. They really thought he was out there. That's a I think that's a fact. Absolutely, they did. That's just how they thought, precisely. Yeah. Interesting. So the next one I want to talk about a little bit. It's also in the courses. And um, just we'll, we'll just like I said, just like I said, another one, we'll scratch the surface on these, the Orphic Dionysian, because we were just talking about Dionysus. So just to stay on the topic, I guess. But the Orphic mysteries are a little bit separate, and they're in a different location, I believe. Why don't you? Will you tell us about this one a little bit? Yeah, the Orphic mysteries are different than other mysteries because they're translocal, and it's it's a bit more like Christianity, where the cult groups are dependent on traveling, not prophets per se, but uh, priests, we might call them, who are spreading the Orphic mysteries, essentially like knocking on doors like Jehovah's Witnesses and telling people that they have mystery rites and, that the, and purifications. And the, it's a bookish religion where they carry around books full of Orphic poems, that is, poems ascribed to Orpheus, and they basically perform rituals for you independently, which give you a better hope for your afterlife. And uh, uh, yeah, in the course, we talk about the gold tablets, which are uh, thought of as Orphic sort of passports or passcodes, but they're they're also like rudimentary map quest uh, or Google map kind of directions for where you go in Hades so that you don't do anything wrong and accidentally return to earth because it's a religion that also believes in reincarnation. Wow. That's fascinating. And with Orpheus, he, he um, he's also a historical character to what the people believed at the time. I'm not sure if he really was or not, but they, this was to the people during to the people of the ancient world. He was a real person. He wasn't a god. He was a real human. And if I'm not, was he was he the priest of Dionysus? Was that what he was? Well, I'm not sure uh, we would call him that. He, but he, he was definitely viewed as a Thracian bard, that is, a singer and a poet. And he, yes, definitely, he lived in a historical place at a historical time, and he was a real dude, and he wrote real poems. And that's how they, that's how they viewed him. And, and his poetry was considered to be older than Homer's poetry. Wow. And he, um, he met his fate, not to get too much into it, but as he passes away from his being attacked, basically, he's still singing his songs. He's still being a bard even when his head's cut off, right? Yeah, it's a bit of a funny story, told really well by Ovid in the Metamorphoses. Yeah. He's killed by decapitation, and his head is thrown in a river, and it continues to sing um, as it floats down the river. And, yeah, I'm not sure what the meaning of that is, but I, I think that <laughs> it is, it's one of the funnier stories about Orpheus, definitely. I noticed that. In three of the four Gospels, 
Jesus' last words are quoting Psalms. And I and I could be I could be reached. I do this a while. I, I like to reach sometimes, you know. I like to spend <laughs> But just, just out of fun, I wonder if there was some, you know, maybe they're looking at the Orphic thing and saying, wow, that's a that's a really great story or a really um, grand way for somebody who's important to pass away to be singing hymns. Maybe this Jesus character should be sim- maybe he or maybe that's really what happened. I don't know. Like, but do you think there might be something there with because the Psalms are songs, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I mean, the question would be whether he uh, sang them or, or sang them. Um, I think, I mean, I always prefer to go where we are most strong sure. in terms of our evidence. So it's really Clement of Alexandria that, that makes the strongest connection between Orpheus and Jesus in the Protrepticus. And in the Protrepticus, Clement portrays Jesus as the true Orpheus. And at the end of the Protrepticus, uh, if I'm not mistaken, or perhaps it's the pedagogue, there's a there's a hymn that Jesus sings as Orpheus. It's it's like an um, That's so it's like an Orphic style hymn, but it's because Jesus is the true Orpheus. And yeah, when I was in Atlanta, I I knew a musician, and he had a logo, and the logo said Orpheus Dei the Orpheus of God, who was Jesus. So this this is a fairly common idea. Yeah. And back to the Nassim preacher, the, the last the last line of his hymn was player of the pipes. So he's he's making that connection too. Player of the pipes. Yeah, the pipes in this case uh, are more connected with pan. They're literally oh, the, pan, right. Sorry, the pan. pan pipes. Yeah. Uh, Orpheus, <laughs> when you see him, when you see him in iconography, he's he's a lyrist. He's almost always has the the lyre, which is the stringed instrument. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, is it true that he has a quote that's similar to "Those who have ears to hear, let him hear"? Or is that something well, else? I don't know if it's close, but um, one of the Orphic fragments is. Close your ears, ye profane. Oh. And it's a command that those who are not ready for the mysteries get out. And uh, this is the reason why Roman Catholics today don't give communion to people who aren't Roman Catholic. Um, The same thing with the Greek Orthodox, because those are mysteries. And if you're not really part of that religious identity get out yeah i mean they don't tell you, they don't tell you to get out but you just you sit in your chair and shut up and that's what makes a mystery religion a mystery religion is the initiation right if i'm not mistaken wouldn't that be the bar minimum at least yes mysteries are initiations yeah I mean, we, i should have mentioned that in when in the first episode on the samothracians i give a general introduction to the mysteries so we don't just get into this without any definitions. We, yeah. <laughs> I walk you through this, so no worries there. Yeah, yeah, and I and I'm pretty sure you did mention that there is an, that's what that's part of the uh, the attributes of a mystery religion is being initiated. Um, yeah, yeah. So for, number four is Isis and Osiris, and now we're going down into Egypt, and this one's really fascinating because you have these two gods who are just extraordinary in their capabilities in their reach and how popular they become and uh yeah let's talk about that for a couple minutes well it's difficult to just give a teaser here but yeah obviously obviously egyptian gods as most of your listeners know they're much older than than greek gods and the greeks knew this in fact herodotus says that you know we we, that is, we Greeks, borrowed from you guys um, the the names for the deities. And uh, Osiris is just another form of Dionysus for most um, most Greeks. Herodotus makes that clear. Yep, absolutely. It uh, goes all the way back to Herodotus. And Isis is a form of Demeter. And so, but when... Essentially, when the Hellenic, when these Hellenic deities had had been fully Hellenized 
you you get distinctive initiation cults that are actually less focused on Osiris than they are on Isis. And so by the second century, you have very distinctive initiation rites for the your local Isis cult. And you can get initiated into Isis. You don't have to go to Egypt. Uh, she has temples in Athens and Corinth and Rome and wherever she has a temple, you can approach the priests and they will give you the directions for purification. You have to abstain from sex for 10 days. You have to fast for 10 days or you can't eat meat for 10 days. Um, you have to be instructed in some of the religious books. And yeah, then you you go through the, the rite and we have the most lovely description of what was involved in the novel called Metamorphoses, book 11, written by Apuleius. And uh, yeah, there's much more, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, because what you what happens after that, you get into in the course, and we're going to save that for the course. It's really, really fascinating. All I'm going to say is there's a lot of um, a lot of things that Apuleius tells us that are just you, it may, it, this thing was big. This thing was this was a real salvation based um, cult, and it was big in Rome, it was big in Greece, it was big all over the place. And I was actually reading through app um, through uh, Pausanias, and he's talking about there was a a giant um, shrine to Isis in central Greece somewhere, where. There was, you know, every year that during certain time of the year, I forgot what time, I forgot what it was. It was like a three-day festival. Yeah, it was a three-day festival. And um, on the third day, they would do some sort of rite, some sort of offering. And somebody who wasn't initiated tried to sneak in. And they went into the inner sanctum and they saw a ghost. And so because they weren't initiated, by the time they got home to tell somebody, they died. They just dropped dead. And then he said, it, he said, Pausanias says it actually happened twice. It happened in Egypt as well. So he's like, he's trying to make you believe this story really happened. But like, it's it, he makes it a big deal. Like, if you're not initiated, do not go to the sanctuary of Isis. Don't do it. You will die. <laughs> what do you think about yeah, that? Because the, the, because the gods provide information and knowledge only to their true devotees. And this is why in the ancient world, atheism was a bad name. Well, unfortunately, it still is uh, in many circles. But um, in the ancient world, yeah, the, if you tried to pry into the the secret information given by the deity, the the deity might kill you, yeah, because they view that as impious, and that's a capital crime in Athens. You know, that's what Socrates was killed for, because he his his official charge was an impiety charge. Um, because he was introducing new gods, or they called them demonites, into the state cult, and they actually killed him. Wow, how how big was, or I should say, how popular was the Temple of Isis in Rome? Oh, very popular, and we, she was, she received huge attention from Caligula. And Vespasian later became a huge donor, the emperor Vespasian for both Isis and Osiris and ensured that the Isis and Osiris cult continued way back into late antiquity. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years after Christianity. Um, it's received huge funding, an amazing temple and again, it's one of those late antique cults that was one of the last to go. I mean, it was just a very powerful thing. Do you think there was a connection between the Serapium with Serapis and this particular Roman imperial, I guess Roman imperial, whatever it is, Roman temple of Isis? Was there, was, are they two separate entities or are they sort of connected? Well, I mean, for, so for a temple, a temple is simply the house of a deity. So, um, you know, it has a prime occupant, either it's a temple to Isis or a temple to Serapis. 
Serapis also had his shrines and temples in other areas like Athens and Rome. Um, and for many, Serapis was just a, a sort of Hellenized form of Osiris, identified also with Hades, that is the god of the underworld. So definitely they're, they're, they're connected. Um, and I would recommend, uh, again, for those who you want to see like a, a, almost a pristine temple of Isis, um, go to Pompeii and because this, it was preserved in, in when the volcano, you know, let loose all of its ash, the, there's an Isis temple there that's, it looks like, uh, I mean, obviously it's damaged heavily. It doesn't have a roof, but it looks like it did almost 20 centuries ago. Wow. And, um, the last thing I want to touch on real quick is this Harpocrates Horus figure. How, how big is what? How how much did this character or this god get revered in his in its time? Maybe even like let's say first century ish. Well, Harpocrates is fun for me because Harpocrates uh, gets the epithet called Carpocrates. Right. And Carpocrates means master of the harvest, and that's what. Um, that's that's what that's the name of a Christian theologian of the second century. <laughs> and since I've written an entire book on Carpocrates, he's very near and dear to my heart. But for Harpocrates, um, he is the he is Isis's child born with he's he's lame, uh, but he's born because Isis essentially committed necrophilia with with Osiris. She here we get back to the phallus imagery. She reconstructed the penis of Osiris and essentially had sex with the dead body of her husband. But the life generating force of her husband was so amazing that she conceived. Wow. For Harpocrates. And Harpocrates is the child sitting on the knees of Isis, whom she's suckling, which later became the model for. Um, which later became the model for the uh, Christ and, and the Virgin Mary. But yeah, if you put up that, if you put up that uh, image again, Harpocrates is, is always depicted like this because that's how yeah. Egyptians uh, depicted the babies. But the Greeks and Romans took this as the sh sign. So wow. he became the god of mystery. It also tells you how old the sh actually is. You know, yes. that's that's a really interesting uh, fact that that symbol of silence goes back this far. This particular um, model that I'm looking at is from the museum in Lauvery, Lauvery, Paris, and it's supposedly a combination of Eros and Harpocrates. It's called Harpocratic Eros. Do you know about this? Yeah, we see theocracy going on here, but and theocracy is the mixing of the deities. So Harpocrates doesn't have wings, right. but Cupid, Cupid or Eros does. But when you mix the gods together, you've got both the gesture of silence and the wings. So they thought of this deity as like a loving, um, you know, sort of similar. Is that what you think they were just comparing the two maybe? But they're comparing the two because they're both children. They never grow up. Oh, they're they're sort you. of like Peter Pan. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, Peter Pan eventually grew up, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's really I I love this 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 particular god has a lot of fascinating. And I'm if I'm not mistaken, he actually does get killed as a as a baby. He was put he was brought by Thoth into the into the. I'm probably gonna butcher this. Whatever. Maybe you know about this. And you can correct it. He's he's taken by Thoth into the forest. And Thoth leaves him there and leaves, goes somewhere else. But then Isis finds him. He's dead, but she revives him. Is this is that how it goes? So it depends on what source you're looking at. But that's actually another child. Oh. Um, and that's, um, so Osiris, to tell a long story, uh, make it short, Osiris mis mistakenly took the goddess Nephthys as his wife Isis and had intercourse with her 
and then Osiris was murdered by Set Typhon, and then Isis figured out that actually her sister Nephthys gave birth to Osiris's child, and that Nephthys had exposed this child out of fear of Seth. And Isis was the one who essentially adopted this child and took care of it as the child of Osiris. And he became Horus the Avenger, who actually, um, yeah, gave Seth a lot of trouble later on. Wow. Interesting. So to, to go on to the next one now, Ploidmendries um, and the Corpus Hermeticum. And this is sort of related to what we're just getting into with these Horus is in there and there's some stuff with stuff with Isis and Osiris in there. But it's really, it's written by Hermes, who's having a dialogue with this character named Tot. Is that his, I think it's his father or son. But what's, what's this about? Yeah, so in, I think it's the fifth or sixth session, we talk about Hermetic Mysteries and there's too much to talk about in one episode. So I focus on the Corpus Hermeticum one, which is a dialogue called the, the Pimandres. And in this dialogue, the divine mind, Pimandres, is having a conversation with Hermes. But later in the literature, Hermes, when he is redeemed or mentally transformed, he then has conversations with his disciples, and one of them is Tot, and another is Asclepius. Um, so, yes, this this literature, essentially, it's, it's more late ancient Egyptian religion, but it's the religion sort of for philosophers, and uh, it's the mystery cult for those who are still absorbed in Egyptian culture, and it gives you the mysteries of creation and it gives you the mysteries of how the world is connected and reincarnation and it has all those egyptian themes but it's a it's a hellenistic religion that's exactly contemporary with christianity and it's a highly philosophic religion that is it's meant for philosophers and people serious about getting good theological education wow and um how long is this text is it is it kind of long compared to other ancient texts no nah, it'll take you 15 oh, minutes to read yeah or less um i mean if you read it as a newspaper you'll be done in five minutes i mean it's not um it's not anything long uh so there's there's the corpus hermeticum uh published by brian copenhaver and uh he called it hermetica and i have hermetica too published um, just in 2018. And this is all the hermetic literature that you'll ever need to to find. That's what I'm, so that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the Hermetica 2, where you take all the hermetic literature and put it into one. That's why it's a little bit longer. Well, Hermetica 2 is, it's, it's not all of hermetic literature, but it's, it's all of the fragments and all everything that Christians say about it. So it's quite extensive. Yeah. Interesting. And, but the original Hermetica is pretty, is relatively short and it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's specific on its own entity. Yeah. It's a, it's a Byzantine collection of ancient Hermetic writings and there's only 17 of them and they're all quite short. They're short little tractates. Um, yeah, it'll take you, uh, I mean, if you read all of them together, three hours, max. Nice. Is um is Hermes considered to be, is this a, a read, how do, I, how do I say this? I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. Because you get the Hermes from the ancient Greek mythology, and then you get this Hermes Trismegistus. Is this, what, what's the difference? Yeah, so Hermes... Trismegistus or thrice great is he's like your Eros and Harpocrates. He's a god that's undergone theocracy that is mixing with the Egyptian deity Thoth or Thoth if you prefer. Um, so he is takes on all the attributes of the ancient Egyptian deity and many of those attributes, like being the creator, 
and being the god of writing and scholarship weren't originally attached to the, the purely Greek Hermes. The purely Greek Hermes is, is associated with um, the market, business, and with messages. He's not a creator. He's not the god of, of wisdom. I mean, he's not stupid, but it's Athena who's the goddess of wisdom. Um, so when Hermes merges with Tote, he gains a whole new repertoire of superpowers, as it were. Wow. And he seems like he's a lot more of a sage in this type of character. He's got like the beard. He looks like a, a high priest. He looks like a, mag a magician, maybe. He has a different look to him than the Hermes that's like real fast running with the wings on his shoes. You know, you, 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 know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, precisely. I mean, in, in obviously in Egyptian iconography, Hermes or Thot is the ibis headed deity, very sure. thin, usually holding a, a pen and a piece of paper. And yeah, that's definitely very different than the Homeric Hermes with his, you know, wing, wings on his feet and pictured as a young man. Yeah. And this Hermes is considered to be the Logos in his respective text. Well, yes, um, the, the Homeric or, or Greek Hermes was the Logos insofar as he w transferred Logi, that is, messages. But when he becomes Hermes thrice great, that Logos aspect is enriched. So he becomes very much the creator of the world, much more like the Logos in wow. John 1. Wow, that's interesting. A lot of people forget, to, don't, don't, don't see that connection with, everybody wants to compare Osiris or Horus, but Hermes is sitting right there like, guys, I'm the Logos. I'm the one who's been there since day one. I'm the, I'm the real deal. And uh, I think there's more connections to be made with Hermes, with, uh, with Jesus, I think. Yeah, you really don't have to look far. Um, <laughs> just a simple knowledge of Greek mythology can really throw a lot of light on the New Testament if yeah. you are willing to to learn. And, and you know, maybe that should be our next course: just simple Greek mythology in a scholarly way. Absolutely, that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be. That's a great idea, actually, guys. Put in the comments what you think about that. If you think we should do that, uh, number six is a really ancient but fascinating rites of the Phrygians called Kybele and Attis. And this is this is a whole nother dimension, but it relates. It is the mysteries. It has and it's um yeah, let's without giving away too much, just give a little bit of a rundown on, on what's going on with the Kybele and Attis mystery religion. Yeah, these are my favorite mysteries. They're the Phrygian mysteries. And Phrygia is central Turkey, um, sort of more on the Western side of it. And yeah, again, we see phallic imagery here. Um, Sibylle is in love with Attis, who is a boy shepherd. But Attis is promised to the daughter of King Midas. And Sibylle is angry about that. And so on their wedding day, he, she drives the bride mad. She cuts off her breasts. And then she drives Attis mad. And Attis completely cuts off his penis and testicles and dies under a pine tree. And... It's a horrible story, uh, but by the time uh, Christianity gets going, they've allegorized Attis so that he has a kind of celestial immortality. So there's a famous, I don't know if you can find it, Neil, but there's a famous um, statue of Attis found in Ostia. That's the port of Rome, O-S-T-I-A. And it's Attis just sitting yeah, I found it. Sitting in supreme, serene peace and life 
and he's sort of he's got this light smile on his face so he's lying yes. down yes yep is there that's another one? Him. That, that's him. There, there is another one, but this, this was, this is totally fine. And he's, he's bearing fruit. And if you look at his crotch area, it, there's nothing there. Oh but yeah. What's, what's important for Addis is these, um, the starry crown, or what's called the. He has a cap with stars on it, but in this image, he, it's more fruits. Um, but. In this image, he's got the rays of the sun coming out. So, this is this is a god who is supremely alive, even though the story said that he died, and that's that's the great mystery. And when you when you go through these mysteries, you learn how to bring together that contradiction. Well, I just pulled up two more images that I want to. Um, throw your way maybe you can explain them a little bit what's up with these two characters that are guarding it do you know who those, those are uh i don't know where this is from uh so i can't comment okay. it says um, ostia it says ostia but you know it, oh I, well that's fine yeah but there's a lot of stuff in ostia uh, I, this could just this could just be a grave of an aristocrat yeah what about this one these okay, are both yeah this is this is uh this is a depiction of a gallus that is a high priest of Addis. And so this guy at one point cut off his own testicles um, and he became a devotee of the great mother who is um, on his right there. And uh, you can see that the great mother has sort of Addis at her feet and this gentleman is giving little bits of incense on a an altar and this was his grave he wanted he, this was his gravestone he wanted to be known as the priest of Addis. interesting now just first to, to switch it up a little bit and talk, uh, you hear this argument a lot about christianity the early christians who were willing to be martyred they, they must have believed it so it must be true well it's like well, you got these priests who are willing to castrate themselves for Addis. Does that make this one true now? We have to. So, like, people can believe something, and, it, and that's fine. But like, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, people believe things, and that's that's the normal. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyone who's done anything in comparative religion knows that people have done, yeah, crazy, insane things, including a massive amounts of self harm for their deities. It doesn't. Doesn't matter who it is. It could be Addis. It could be Kronos. It could be um, you know Allah. Yeah. It could be uh, could be some god that we've never even heard of, like Juba Juba bird. I mean, who knows? Um, like, but people do, out of devotion to their deities, engage in practices of self harm, and that's a sign of supreme devotion. In the case of Addis, the devotion is actually directed to the Great Mother because essentially you're giving your sexuality yeah. to the Mother so that you can focus on her. Yeah, and so do you think there's a is there something to be said about the blood of Addis having having magical properties similar to the blood of Jesus having similar properties? Uh, they don't really thematize that. Uh, all that they say is that from the blood of Addis came the violets. Um, that is the violet flowers. And so that's why in images of Addis, he is surrounded by purple flowers. Wow. Um, but beyond that, um, they, they don't make much of the blood. It's the act of sacrifice that they really emphasize. Yeah. And so... It's not like his blood that gives you salvation. It's just a simple look. His blood made to or made these flowers grow. It's just kind of. It's not like they don't like focus on it as like the central theme of this worship. Is that what you say the difference would be? Yeah, I mean, you know, some religions have a lot to do with blood, and some don't. I mean, I guess vampire vampirism, you know, has a lot to do with blood too, but. 
I don't know. I mean, so what? I mean, it, it's it's sort of like here's a great case where when we're doing our comparisons, we don't want to like privilege Christianity and then yeah. see see how other cults like measure up to it because the point of comparison is just to see and we'll get to this in a second, but to put all religions on an equal playing field, you know, right. we don't we don't sit down and say, "Well, oh, how how similar to Christianity are you?" Well, I mean, many of these people like remember they have religions that are much older than christianity so if you ask them that you know it'd be like what the heck are you talking about and who cares what's christianity so i mean <laughs> yeah I mean, it's just important to keep in mind um, no, it, i agree with that 100 percent. and i think the only reason why people love to do it is because we live in a world especially in the west and in america where most people are christians and so i mean i mean if you go to other parts of the world most people might be is muslim so they're probably comparing things to Islam over there. And if you go into India, people are probably comparing things to their Hindu religion. And I think that's kind of just like how it naturally forms. But with that being said, I agree with you 100%. I think that these religions are just as special, if not more, I, would, I don't want to say more, but like they're older and they're, 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 they go back farther. They have more influence on what came afterwards, just naturally through evolution. It's like it's like trying to compare different hominids. But the ones that came first are the ones that came first. That's just the way it is. So you have to go through these ones to sort of explain how religion gets to the point where it gets to in modern day times. If that makes sense. Well, right. And so this is, you know, why scholarship is important. You know, I mean, I don't know, maybe some people think scholars are just useless, you know, <laughs> and diluted and maybe slightly diabolical but i mean this is what we do right so we we don't at least you know those who are doing serious work in classics and philology we don't say you know we're not really interested that much in prioritizing christianity we're interested in getting the perspective of another person another group another religion hearing their voice distinctively um, so, and yes, that takes effort and that takes discipline and, and good methodology right. to sort of bracket your, your own beliefs to give full credence and respect to those of others. Yeah. I think that's important. The methodology thing, cause you get, you get a lot of people, I'm not going to say any names, but you get a lot of people who they make a hypothesis and then their methodology is I, now I'm going to look for every little thing under every single corner, look under every nook and cranny to find a case to make this hypothesis look correct. That to me is like, it, it's such a, I, I, I just, you see it all over the place, especially with amateur people like myself on YouTube, who I'm not going to say, like I said, I'm not going to say names, but <laughs> you, you get a lot of that. It's like, here's my hypothesis. Now I'm going to show you why I can make, make it look like it's true. Anyone can do that. Anybody can make something look true. I made I made a um and I want to get to Christianity for the last couple of minutes, but I was gonna say I made a I made a fake um what do you how do, how do I say this a fake claim. There's actually a a Egyptian pharaoh named Isesi I S E S I who had a vizier named Ptahhotep, and he had a mother named Mariset, and I go look guys, but I found Jesus in the year 2500 BCE. Look, his name looks similar. He's got a he's got a vizier whose name is Pitahotep. That could be Peter, and his mother's name is Mary. It's so crazy, but like people will actually do stuff like that. I'm not gonna like I said. I don't want to get into names or anything, but I've seen similar arguments made by people because the name might look similar, but it's like we're, mm -hmm. we're, the methodology behind that, and and then you have to ask yourself what is the motivation for people to make a secret religion based on another religion that has a totally different time period and a different language in a different country. What, what, what would be the point of that? There is no point because it's not, you know what I'm saying? I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, I think that, yeah, I mean, and I, what the irony of this is that some people are trying to, in a sense, undermine Christianity by pointing to these so-called parallels, many of which are very superficial, but the irony really is that these people are so Christocentric, that is so 
So in a sense, um, prioritizing Christianity when they compare, that they are in, in effect distorting the religion of other people who aren't Christian by making it look more like Christianity. And in a, in a sense, that methodology really, it's unfortunate because it really backfires. And what I always encourage my students to do is, it's what the Greeks called the epoche, but what we call bracketing, it's not totally possible to bracket all your beliefs. It's a mental exercise that you practice and a skill that you learn over years of training. Christianity was a religion. It began, and I believe it will end someday. And people will look back on it with the religion of, you know, the 28th century or the 30th, 35th century and want to do comparisons on, of Christianity, and it will be a dead religion. And that's where we are now with the others. I mean, and many of them aren't completely dead, um, you know. <laughs> I mean, there are modern uh, pagans and believers in Greek deities, so I want to pay my respects to them. Um, but yeah, that's where we will be. So how silly will it be when we look back to the 21st century and we see all these people trying to compare and their only method of comparison is to see how similar the other religions are to Christianity. Well, what is so important about Christianity? That will be just another dead religion, potentially within a few hundred years. There's nothing, it will, or it will morph into something else that is entirely unrecognizable. It might still call itself Christianity. I don't know. But let's just stop prioritizing that. Um, that's not good methodology. Good point, good point. And just to finish this off, you have the last course on the Christian on what's called Christianity and the Mysteries. Without giving it too much away, I do want to give somebody an idea of why this is the last one and what it, what, you, what exactly is sort of a quick, without telling too much, summary of this one. Well, really, Neil, we've been talking about that already yeah, yeah. for the past yeah. 10 to 15 minutes, because essentially what the last session is, it's about how to compare. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people love this theme set up by James George Frazier on dying and rising gods. And so I, I give you my take on the matter. I tell you why I disagree with James George Frazier, and I try to train your minds to conceive of, yeah, first of all, Christianity as a mystery religion and what it has to, what it has to offer. And um, yeah, it, it's really about comparison and how we do it well. And so I will leave it to your readers to, or your viewers to, you know, buy the course and, um, yeah, try to deepen their knowledge and their uh, methodology and their ability to compare and think in a sophisticated and deep way about these things, which will enable them, yes, to go beyond, you know, a lot of the chatter and really enter more deeply into knowledge and wisdom. Fascinating, fascinating. And I just want to say, guys, the course is coming out very soon. But in the meantime, check out the channel that I'm David Litwa has on YouTube. And um, like I said, those are that's the outside looking in mysteries. The greater mysteries are at the Patreon. And there's links for that in the description as well. And um, yeah, this, is, this has been great. Thank you for your time. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.